Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I'm really looking forward to, and I hope you are too, to this wonderful uh, day of programs. Uh, it's going to continue nonstop until 4 p.m. today, so it's a long day, but I think uh, you'll probably be glued to your computer or whatever uh, every minute. I'm uh, hoping that'll be the case. Uh, I want to just say this up front about Cassetta without elaborating in great detail. Uh, I think it has clearly advanced our knowledge of early Texas art and broadened it in so many ways. I think last night's program was a pretty clear example of that. And uh, every chance I get since I was there at the very beginning when uh, uh, Cassetta had a, well, I wouldn't say a feeble start because I think it hit the ground running almost day one, but it has evolved and it's really become uh, a real force. And I think that's being recognized more broadly uh, across the state and even across the country. But I do like to tip my hat to Bill Reeves and to Bill Cheek, uh, who really got this going and brought together so many wonderful collectors and scholars and people. Uh, and so we're making strides. And the story of early Texas art, uh, in some ways, has only begun to be uh, recognized and understood in the way that we're uh, coming around to it now. Uh, there are a number of initiatives that have happened uh, in our recent history. Uh, one of the things that's very important, uh, and I encourage all of you, if you have knowledge of this, is uh, we want to capture and save the archives of artists, many of whom are uh, becoming elderly and some passing from the scene. Uh, and usually, hopefully, their uh, art, their body of work survives, but very often their notebooks, their uh, photographs even that they took, uh, anything related to their life is of importance. And so Cassetta has really been working hard to preserve those archives in different institutions. Uh, at the museum in San Angelo, we have the Bill and Mary Cheek Cassetta archive, uh, and a number of people have brought things there and uh, we are scanning them. Uh, we're putting them on the Texas portal uh, to the extent that we can. So scholars anywhere in the world will have access to them. Uh, and there are a lot of other things. One little thing I'd like to mention, it was initiated by Ted and Nancy Paul. Nancy's on our board now, and uh, uh, I tip my hat to them as well because they created a research initiative. Uh, we produced some really wonderful papers and original research uh, with, uh, in some cases, graduate students, in other cases, curators and scholars. Uh, so all these things are working hand in hand, I think, to uh, really uh, as I said, I think begin to explore this amazing visual arts heritage of Texas. Um, now, uh, I know that a number of you probably had some technical challenges yesterday. Uh, and I'll have to say this, that uh, Zoom is a very imperfect uh, medium. It's a lot better than having nothing. And I think it works generally fairly well. But uh, most of the issues that you're likely to encounter are fairly local. Uh, I was a part of a big Zoom meeting just last week, and we connected with Israel and Europe, uh, and it was flawless, but people just down the street were having difficulties, so that is one of the challenges, and I apologize for that. That's pretty much out of our control. If we have any issues on our end, uh, technically, we will alert you to that, and uh, you know it'll be a kind of standby, but that has not happened yet happily. Uh, and I do want to mention a couple of the folks behind the scenes, uh, because this technology is pretty complicated. We're switching back and forth. We have people in different locations. Uh, but our good friend, Caleb Bell, who's the curator at the Tyler Museum, uh, is working uh, from Tyler. And then uh, one of the real champions of this is Blanca Hernandez. You know, she's been behind the scenes, and a lot of you have never met her, but uh, unless uh, she's been at a couple of our live symposiums, but a lovely person and brilliant and really working very hard. Uh, and then, of course, we have a whole committee that's put all this together. Uh, and uh, it's been led by Bonnie Campbell uh, and Sarah Beth Wilson. And uh, I'm sure as the day goes by and in our scrolling credits, they'll be acknowledged, the whole team. Uh, but those two particularly have been absolutely fanatical and dedicated to the details of all this. And then uh, when Sarah Beth comes up shortly, uh, she may offer you a couple little tips uh, if you're struggling a bit with the technology. Uh, the other thing is that we are going to record all of this. Uh, and so by about midweek to the end of next week, it'll be online uh, and available to you again, recorded. So if you miss some things or you have to leave for a while, uh, 
or you just want to see it all over again? Because uh, I know I do. I think uh, Curator Christopher Bell's or uh, Beer's talk yesterday was fascinating. I didn't get enough of that, and I want to see it again. So today, uh, we're going to have some very insightful talks by leading scholars about some of the great image makers of Texas. It's an amazing lineup of people. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have our lunch hour chat. I call it Stump the uh, Experts, uh, and I think that'll be kind of fun. Uh, and as I also said yesterday, uh, perhaps even in those conversations, uh, who knows, we might come up with some additional ideas for future programs. Uh, we never stop in that regard. Uh, and then uh, so many of you who are collectors probably know one or two or perhaps all the uh, art dealers in Texas, uh, but maybe not as well as you think. And then some of you may uh, not have really gotten active in your collecting yet. Uh, so today we're going to have a whole session featuring nine different galleries and auction houses, and they will really get a little more personal, show you where they uh, operate from, uh, what their philosophy is, how they got into the business, things of that nature. Uh, they're, each of their individual presentations are not very lengthy, uh, but it's really wonderful, and it's a, a real asset, I think, if you're an active collector to get to know these folks better. So I'm very excited about that. So now... Uh, I think with uh, nothing more, no further ado, uh, I'm thrilled to let us commence with our program, and uh, I believe we're ready for that. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Ellen Bowie Neewike, and then also Francine Carraro, who is here with us. She is listed um, up there, but we had a few tech issues this morning. That, you know, unfortunately, the Zoom gods were not working with us. So uh, Francine's here. She's listening. But Ellen will be delivering her presentation for us today. Just a couple of quick notes before I do our intros and turn it on to over to our speakers. I do want to direct you to the chat feature where my colleague Kayla Bell has put a few uh, tech tips. But just let us know if you have any questions as well for our speakers through the chat feature as well as the Q&A feature similar to last night. And there will be a moment um, at the end of each talk where we'll be addressing questions. Okay, well, that's enough for me. So I'm going to introduce our two speakers now. Ellen Bowie Neewike, who you see on the screen with me, served as curator of the Bywater Special Collections in the Hammond Arts Library at Southern Methodist University for almost 34 years until her retirement just earlier this year in July. Congrats, Ellen. It's excellent. She became assistant curator of the Jerry Bywater's Collection on Art of the Southwest in 1987 and three years later was appointed curator of Bywater Special Collections in the newly constructed Hammond Arts Library. For the next three decades, Ellen and Dr. Sam Ratcliffe curated exhibitions for the Hahn Gallery. While at SMU, Ellen wrote the book, Jerry Bywater's Lone Star Printmaker, and was the recipient of the Cassetta Publication Award in 2008. In addition, she was involved in establishing several SMU digital websites highlighting Texas artists. Ellen's new retirement job will be serving as a board member for TACO, the Texas Arts Collectors Organization, and working in her jewelry studio studying ancient and contemporary metal techniques. So we're really excited to hear from Ellen. And real quick, before we switch to Ellen's presentation, I will do our intro for Francine Carraro. Dr. Francine Carraro is the retired director of the Wichita Falls Museum of Art, having previously served as director of the Grace Museum in Abilene and the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson, Wyoming. She holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin and served as a tenured professor of art history at Texas State University in San Marcos. She is author of Jerry Bywater's A Life in Art, published in 1994, and numerous articles and exhibition catalogs. Currently, she is an appraiser specializing in Texas art. And we're hoping perhaps during the Q&A, our um, tech woes will be gone and Francine will be able to join us. So we're going to give that a shot in a little bit. But Ellen, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Hey, okay, here we go. We're going to share the screen. <laughs> Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yes, right, can everybody, yes. Okay, all righty. Uh, first of all, I need to note that in 1987, Dr. Sam Ratcliffe and I began working together in Bywater Special Collections, and for the next 30 plus years, continued to add collections to the already established Jerry Bywater's collection due to Francine Carrero. 
and archival material from many of these collections were used in this presentation. And I would like to begin with the importance, <coughs> the importance, the role of SMU Southwest Review had in Bywater's early education and career. When I first started working at SMU in 1987, Sam and I were located in a very small office in Fondren Library, and boxes of the Southwest Review journals were stored on the shelves, so I began reading them, and it was here that I learned the importance of the journal to Bywaters and many of his colleagues. And on the left, you see the Southwest Review Winter 1932 and an announcement for a study course in the new regionalism. And the center image is a self-portrait of Bywaters in 1969. And on the right, you see the entrance to Bywater Special Collections and uh, boxes of archives located in the holdings there. In the early 1920s, Bywaters began collecting art and museum catalogs, clippings, correspondence, and photographs focusing on the cultural history of Texas, Dallas, and the Southwest and continued to do so during his career as an artist, critic, curator, museum director, and teacher. And this material helped shed new light on the historical development of Bywater's career and the development of the arts in Dallas. And at the end of my presentation, I will show a slide that contains additional information about the collections that Sam and I uh, uh, collected in the 30 years and some links where you can find more information. Bywater's humor during his SMU days. At SMU, Bywater served as editor and produced illustrations for the Crimson Colt, a short-lived college humor magazine published in the 1920s. In these early illustrations, one can already sense Bywater's natural ease in drawing and the wit and humor that would later reappear in his work. But it was not until his last year in college when he took an elective course in painting from Ralph Roundtree a respected artist and art instructor at SMU, that Bob Waters began to think about a career in art. Trying to decide between being a writer or an artist, Bob Waters recalled asking his parents for financial help in order to study art in Europe, which they, they did and possibly wanting their son to have a travel companion and one already established as an artist in Dallas, they allowed Bywaters to travel to Europe by ship, the SS Penland with Roundtree in 1927 in order to paint, visit museums and study art. These were decisive years for Bywaters. He was now contemplating a profession in art, even though he knew his father had doubts about the profession. And one can sense Bywater's humor in the title of his pencil sketch, self-portrait sketch, Paris, Imperator, Imperator, a Latin word meaning to command. His simple self-portrait made in Paris on September 1st, 1927, with what appears to be an outline of the Basilica, the Sacred Heart of Paris in the right background, shows a determined young man ready to command. The images of Bywaters in profile with a beard that was popular among the young artists and writers of the time. These were decisive years for Bywaters. Only 21 years old, he was now contemplating a profession in art. And I have to, being an archivist, <clears throat> I have to tell you a little bit about the ship he was on. Of course, I would do research on this. Um, the ship was completed in 1920, and it was actually part of the White Star Line, the same as the Titanic. And later in the 1940s, it became a uh, troop ship for the Allies in World War II, and the ship was bombed and sunk <clears throat> in 1941. So that aside, I just had to add that little bit, bit of information. Uh, and on the right is an image of Bywaters uh, standing in the patio of the lines at the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. Bywaters returns to Texas and the Southwest. And I wanted to show you SMU Southwest Review the summer 1928. And if you look at the bottom, Ernest Blumenshawn, note that Alexander Hogue wrote um, the article. So Bywaters and many of his contemporaries were very involved with the Southwest Review. 
And it was John McGinnis, founding editor of the Southwest Review, who influenced Bywaters and his circle of artist friends to look within their immediate Southwest surroundings for subject matter. McGinnis, a professor of literature at SMU, as well as editor of the Southwest Review, was a tireless advocate of local cultures. Under his guidance, the review became an influential organ for a movement that the editors termed a new regionalism. And by the way, these old Southwest reviews, they are all available at SMU's De Gaulle Library. And then the influence of Diego Rivera. <clears throat> and I have to tell you a little bit about the photograph that you see here, it's attributed to Tina Mendati. Back in the 20s, she did work for the Associated Press. And when I first started working at SMU, uh, I found these photos just in a file on Tina Mendati. And most likely, and Francine may need to correct me on this, but most likely Bywaters, she had a store, photo photography store in Mexico City. Most likely Bywaters just bought it in her store. And it is stamped on the back, Associated Press, and as far as we know, we've checked with the AP, this is the only photograph. There are no uh, negatives or anything. This is the only photograph. <clears throat> um, but during this same time, I have to backtrack a little bit. During the same time, uh, across the border in Mexico, several legendary artists were attracting the world's attention with their revolutionary work, especially in mural painting. Bywaters first heard about the Mexican mural movement while in Spain. In February 1928, he traveled alone by train to Mexico to study the work of renowned artists such as Rivera, Orozco, Siqueiros. But it was Bywaters' use of Mexican themes that inspired Bywaters to take greater interest in his own surroundings, as did the influence of his friend and mentor, John McGinnis. And over on the right, you see um, uh, the contents. And also here are his working notes that are in the archives as well. And other articles written by Jerry Bywaters for the Southwest Review include on the left, the Allied Art Show, spring 1935, and right, the New Texas Painters, spring 1936. And if you contact the Dollar Library, and also I'll be glad to tell you the person you need to contact there too. Some of these uh, journals are online. So if there's a certain issue you would like to read online, um, I can direct you to that source. Bow Waters began writing for the Dallas Morning News in 1926 and served as art critic from 1933 to 1939. And here are two articles he wrote, one on the left uh, from his uh, journey to Mexico is on um, Diego Rivera. And then the one on the right, Thomas Hart Benton in 1934. And I think it's very interesting in the archives, you find correspondence between these artists, including this from, from Thomas Hart Benton to Jerry Bywaters. It's not dated, but if you can't read it, I'll read it. It says, Dear Jerry, this is about the best I can do. Everything is packed up and I'm about to climb in my car. If I land anywhere near you, count on me for a couple of cool ones. Thomas Hart Benton. And Francine and I discussed this <clears throat> when we were preparing our talks. Do we include the Dallas Nine? Do we not? Uh, and what I am doing, I'm just pulling material from the archives, and I'm just going to briefly talk about the Dallas Nine, because I think this could be a presentation by itself. Um, and Bywaters is included in the group, and they did show at the Dallas Public Art Gallery February 1932 in the Majestic Theater Building, second floor and John McAnkeny was director and he actually became the Musin's first professional director. And also I included a, um, and you see the list of the nine artists, Bywaters, Dozier, Douglas, Goff, Lester, uh, McCain, Nichols, Spruce, and Wynn. 
And there's an article there on the right uh, just that talks briefly, but they don't mention the non in the article. And I'll show you where the non came from. The exhibition captured the intention of the New York City-based magazine Art Digest and published an article entitled Young Texans, All Under 30, shown in Dallas. <clears throat> and in its March 15, 1932, published the article. And do you see where the nine originated from? Right here. And then I highlighted it right here. Uh, so that is, as far as I know, that is where the non originated or the term came from. And also in going through the archives, I tried to find photographs of the nine uh, closer to the 1932 date, but these are from like the 1920s through the 1940s and beginning with John Douglas, and I've been waiting 34 years to show that photograph of John Douglas and Revo Bassett, but that's them. And I have a red arrow that points out John Douglas. Then you have Jerry Bywaters and Dozier, Lloyd Goff, William Lester, and John McCain. And then on the bottom, you have Perry Nichols, Everett Spruce, and Buck Wynn. The Dallas Art Scenes, <clears throat> 1930s. After Bob Waters returned home from Europe, he began taking additional art classes at the Art Institute of Dallas, uh, which had been founded in 1926 by its director, Olin Herman Travis. Bob Waters' interest in fine arts and commercial art was drawn to the School for Additional Training in Art and Graphic Design. Bywater seemed to be everywhere in the Dallas art world of the early 1930s. In the 1932-1933 Art Institute of Dallas brochure, he was listed as an associate instructor for painting and graphic representation. In addition, he served as the first director of the Alice Street Carnival in Dallas. And in, not, in August 1932, he began publishing and editing a new magazine entitled Southwestern Arts, which promoted Southwest artists and published articles on their work and art events in the area. And I love the poster, What is Art? That is attributed to Owen Travis, and that's from the uh, Alice Street Carnival. Now the following slides, I'm gonna show you works of art that are examples of Bob Water's most productive years. And I'm going to be, I'm beginning with the Texas, Texas and the Lone Star Printmakers. And in May 1938, Bywaters was one of 16 Texas artists who formed their own printmaking organization, which was loosely based on the Associated American Art Artists Organization. Bywaters and his contemporaries quickly picked up on this new organization's effort to distribute prints throughout America in the 1930s and in 1938 formed their own printmaking distribution organization, the Lone Star Printmakers. And Alexander Hogue, one of the founding members, designed the logo using the Lone Star, Lone Star for the organization's brochure. There were four circuits, but it looks like from the archives that they were planning a fifth circuit that the outbreak of World War II most likely put a halt to that. But here you have election day in Balmeray and Ranch Hand and Pony. And please know there are two Ranch Hand and Ponies, one that he did in 1938. And there was a later version he did. It's, it's a completely different play that he did in 1944 for the Associated American Artists. And there are two different prints. Bywaters continued to study the American Southwest landscape and its, people, and its people by participating in the New Deal art programs with murals such as the Farmersville Post Office mural entitled Soil Cons Conservation in Collin County in 1940. And Bywaters Special Collections, uh, it does have the archival material relating to the mural work, including the contract for the mural, working sketches, and the painting showing the detail of the mural entitled The Provider, which is now part of the University Art Collection at SMU. And the next few slides contain photos and working sketches made by Bywaters from his travels through Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas from the 1930s and 1940s. And traveling with Otis Dozier on many sketching trips, 
Bywater stu studied the landscape by photographing and sketching the unique characteristics of the land and incorporating into works of art and book illustrations. Take, for example, Book Jacket for Naturalist of the Frontier by Samuel Wood Geyser, 1937, published by the University Press in Dallas, later the SMU Press. And I love um, all of his sketches for the yuccas and central plants and how he incorporated them into works of art, including Chisos Mountains. It's a pastel on paint paper, 1937. <clears throat> Another prime example of his travels through the American West and how he viewed the vast landscape as Ranchgate, 1938, while on canvas in the photograph of near Alpine. And I have to tell you, I'll show you resources at the very end, uh, because before I retired, uh, we, we established a website uh, for archival material, uh, but there is a lot to add. This was just the beginning. And also where the mountains meet the plains, 1939, oil on Masonite. And this is an interesting note, is that the painting was a gift to SMU from the 1939 and 1940 senior classes. And it officially began, it was the beginning of the university art collection at the university. And then at the bottom, you see the print Mountain Eat the Plains. It's 1940 and also the working sketch for the, the lithograph. And you'll notice that the lithograph <coughs> is written reverse because when it was printed, the image uh, is reversed. And then he, his drawings from Big Ben in Texas and in New Mexico. And again, the Southwest Review pops up with the article by Z Carl Ziggrosser. Uh, he was appointed uh, the curator of prints and drawings and rare books at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in 1941. But he, the, his Bywaters and his colleagues, they were gaining uh, national attention. And traveling on a Guggenheim Fellowship, Ziggrosser visited Texas in 1939 as part of his tour through America to collect information on printmaking activities across the country. He visited Dallas before traveling to New Mexico, Arizona, and California for additional research on contemporary American prints, the result of which was another article featuring groups from the West of his journey. In 1941, his article, Prints of the Southwest, appeared in the South Southwest Review. And then Bywaters continued his travels into Colorado. And here are photographs and sketches for the lithograph False Fronts, 1939, and Divide Colorado, 1946. The two lithographs demonstrate Bywaters' interest in architecture and his use of lithography to enhance architectural elements found in, these Amer in the American Southwest. A new career. Okay from the archives, I uh, pulled this. It was an announcement uh, for an exhibition of paintings and sculpture at the John Douglas Gallery, but note the date, December 7th, 1941. And note what Bywaters wrote at the bottom, Pearl Harbor Bond, 1941, no visitors. So the beginning of World War II brought many changes to the art world, including Dallas. Bywaters continued to create works of art, but his concentration was now directed toward administrative responsibilities at the Dallas Museum of Art. In 1942, he was appointed art director and supervisor of the education department, and a year later made director of the museum, and a post he maintained and held, or held until 1964. And I just wanted to end with the online um, collections that you can, you can find on your computer uh, and all the collections that uh, are available to view in the archives. And I'm finding that a lot of these online digital collections are being noticed even internationally. For example, Barbara Maples right here, 
Um, the Pompidou Center in Paris, France, found a photograph of her in, uh, our, on our um, digital website, and they used it for an exhibition entitled Women uh, in Abstraction. Uh, the exhibition just closed at the Pompidou, but it's about to open at the Guggenheim in Paris, and, I'm sorry, in Spain. So the information is getting out there, um, but we have a lot more to do. So I think now, Sarah Beth, do we want to go over to Francine's paper? Sure. I'll share my screen right now. Okay. I'll stop share mine. Perfect. Okay. Just a reminder to all of our viewers, if you have any questions, please submit them through the chat feature and we will be addressing those after the presentation. Okay. Okay. Slide one. <clears throat> Reflecting on the topic of Jerry Bywater's then and now, I'm thinking about my re relationship with Jerry and his understanding of the importance of Texas art and American art. By gathering my memories of Jerry Bywater's, I can describe what I, what I knew about his importance when I first met him 48 years ago. By gathering both the words of Jerry Bywater's and the observations of his colleagues, I can describe the general understanding of Bywater's importance in the past. By citing recent scholarship about the history of art in Texas, I can posit my understanding of the importance of Jerry Bywater's now. Okay, slide. I think we, we stay on this slide, Sarah Beth, for just a second. Okay. Okay. I met Jerry Bywaters in 1973 when I entered the graduate program in art history at Southern Methodist University. My advisor, Mary Vernon, introduced me to Jerry Bywater saying that he was a very important leader and visionary in Texas art. Must say, I fell in love with the soft-spoken, skinny, witty gentleman. I enrolled in his class on the history of American art. Our textbook was an early edition of Mandelowitz's History of American Art. But Bywaters did not teach to the text. He told a lot of anecdotal stories about his friends in the art world and his experience as director of the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. His lectures were hard to follow, but very entertaining. We graduate students called him Mr. B. Okay, next slide. In graduate school at SMU, one of my modern art textbooks was authored by Barbara Rose, who stated empathetically that the art originalist, Thomas Hart Benton, John Stuart Curry, and Grant Wood, was a detour in the mainstream of American art. And by extension, Rose ignored the art of Bywaters and the Texas originalist, whom she de deemed unimportant. Throughout his life, Bywater saw his art and the reputation of Texas regionalists go in and out of fashion, resulted in his lifelong mission as an art critic, art educator, and museum director to set the record straight about Texas artists and to place Texas art in the mainstream of American art. In 1935, as art critic for the Dallas Morning News, Bywater's described and defined the new regionalism as demonstrated by Texas artists. Quote, there is a territory west of the Alleghenies which deserves to be included in the American art nation. And he continues to say, in Texas, artists have at least gained confidence in themselves and their native environment. End quote. And in 1936, Bob Waters wrote in the Southwest Review that his art and that of his contemporaries in Texas had entered the mainstream of American culture serving a social purpose and depicting their native environment integral to national artistic inspiration. Okay, next slide. Bywater's long life, lifelong persistence and purposeful mission to promote the art and artist of the Southwest resulted in a resurgence of interest in and scholarly investigation of the history of Texas art. Beginning in the early 1970s, in 1971, Bywaters produced a touring exhibition, Texas Painting and Sculpture of the 20th Century, in which Bywaters wrote the section on Dallas and the exhibition catalog. 
1974, the Dallas Museum of Art presented a major exhibition, A Salute to the Dozers of Dallas, along with a publication that described the painting and sketchbooks of Otis Dozier's, Otis Dozier and the art of Velma Dozier, who is a jewelry designer and founder of the Craft Guild of Dallas. Okay, next slide. Also in 1974, Bywaters was appointed by the Smithsonian Institution as director of the Archives of American Art, Texas Project, to gather primary research material about Texas artists. With a sense of urgency to preserve history, Bywaters hired me and other SMU graduate students to travel across Texas and conduct taped interviews of living Texas artists. This material was transcribed and microfilmed by the Archives of American Art. Bywaters was a collector and archivist of information about Texas artists, and he donated his archival material to SMU at intervals from 1980 until his death in 1989. After his death, the family also donated to, S uh, to SMU his archives, which had been stored at his home. In 1990, the collection was relocated to the new Jake and Nancy Hammond Arts Library and housed in the appropriately named Jerry Bywater Special Collections Wing, constructed with funds from the Margaret and Eugene McDermott Foundation of Dallas. Next slide. Okay, in 1975, Mr. B advised me to research and write my master's thesis on important Texas artists. The title of my master's thesis completed in 1976 is, is Painters of the Southwest Landscape, Otis Dozier, William Lester, and Everett Spruce. Mr. B emphasized that I should meet and interview these artists and to conduct primary research because they were very important American artists and that I should set the record straight my thesis was approved and signed by Mary Vernon, Dan Wingren, and Jerry Bywaters. While I was working on my master's thesis, my good friend and fellow graduate student, <coughs> Marla Bettisberger, you know her as Marla Ziegler, was also working on her master's thesis entitled Jerry Bywaters, Regional Artist of the Southwest. Marla was the first to write a biography of Jerry Bywaters, identifying his development and importance as a painter, muralist, printmaker, art critic, educator, and museum director, and most assuredly, she documented Bywaters' burgeoning, in, burgeoning interest in, in lasting dedication to the art of the Southwest. Marla related that after Bywaters graduated from SMU and traveled to Europe, he enrolled at the Dallas Art Institute in 1927, where he met fellow students Everett Spruce and William Lester, and he studied with artists Olin Travis and Thomas Dell, who introduced Bywaters to the idea of, hold on just a minute. Introduced Bywaters to the idea of developing his own individual style of painting. Bywaters traveled to the art centers of Mexico, New York City, and Old Lyme, Connecticut to mold his development as an artist. Much later, he described his teacher, John Sloan, at the New York Art Students League as, for, as a forceful personality with a particular philosophy that was right for his students who were beginning to feel an urge to peer deeper into the heart of America and try to forget the Paris Boulevards. Marla interviewed Bywaters on June 18, 1975, and he stated, I realized I wanted to get back down there to Texas to try to find myself in relation with my own environment. Bywaters became convinced that for his art to be significant, it had to reflect his own life, his background and environment. It was clear that Bywaters had studied the art of French Impressionists, and modernist Mexican muralist and New York American scene painters, but he did not want his own art to be derivative. He sought to locate the heart and soul of art in America as he communicated with his artist colleagues in the growing art community in Dallas. Returning to Texas during the Great Depression, Bob Waters described it as a perilous time for initiating both a marriage and a career as a painter. Bob Waters developed as a painter and as a spokesman for a mission to set the record straight. In brief, 
Early on, Bywaters rebelled against the stylistic domination of American art by European art, especially Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, ex as expressed by the Texas Blue Bonnet paint painters. However, Bywaters credited the, the Texas Blue Bonnet painters for celebrating the regional landscape. Bob Waters wanted to create his own art that was stylistically grounded in realism that described a particular place and time. Okay, next slide. In 1976, SMU University Galleries produced a rep retrospective exhibition of the art of Jerry Bywaters. In the foreword of the exhibition catalog, the SMU faculty honored their esteemed colleague knowing that Bywaters taught himself not to belittle his roots. And he developed his entire career as a professional in the arts to the cultural life of the Southwest. The faculty, all much younger than Bywaters, also noted that, <clears throat> quote, as a teacher and co a colleague, he remains as alive today, today's art, pardon me, as alive to today's art world as the youngest among us, end quote. The introduction to the catalog was written by Lloyd Goodrich, who has retired from directing the Whitney Museum of American Art. Goodrich lauded Bywaters as a museum director, and he described Bywaters as an artist who, devoted, who was devoted to the art of the Southwest, with no trace of the regional chauvinism and ideological dogmatism of the Midwestern regionalist painters of the 1930s. In 1976, the 1976 exhibition at SME was important because it became the touchstone of the reassurance of interest in Jerry Bywater's art. Despite the success of Bywater's and his fellow Texas artists in the 1930s to achieve national recognition for the regionalist approach and stylistic style, art critics and art historians of the 1960s and 1970s were uninterested. The prevailing assessment of the evolution of American art focused on the emergence of, of non-objective abstraction and abstract expressionism, expressionism, which was viewed as the logical climax of American art. The movement of the regionalist, originalism and realism of the 1930s and 1940s were considered retros, retrogressive, myoptic, and provincial. Okay, the next slide. In 1985, curator Rick Stewart at the Dallas Museum of Art set about setting the record straight about regionalism in his landmark exhibition, Lone Star Regionalism, the Dallas Nine in Their Circle. Stewart described the new regionalism in Texas in the 1930s, which was concerned with raw sensibility, and he established the leadership and legacy of Bywaters, Hogue, Dozier, Spruce, and others at the Dallas Circle, who had declared artistic independence from European stylistic influences. Next slide. My doctoral thesis, a biography of Jerry Bob Waters, finished in 1990, was published by the University of Texas Press in 1994. In the introduction I wrote today, Bob Waters is, is acknowledged as the leader of a group of Texas artists who broke out of the limitation limitations of provincialism and attain national recognition. Bywaters ranks with other great American artist teachers such as Robert Henri, Charles Hassam, and John Sloan who work consistently to identify and elevate American art. 27 years later, I still think this is true. Next slide. A remarkable chapter in Bywater's career is his tenure as director of the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts from 1943 until 1964. Bywater's grasped the opportunity to place the art of the Southwest within the context of American art with such major exhibitions as the National Touring Exhibition Texas Panorama that was sponsored by the American Federation of Art. Bywater's major focus as a museum director, however, was to bring the world of art to Texas with such important exhibitions as 200 Years of American Painting and Leonardo da Vinci and His Times. Under Bywater's direction, attendance at the DMFA grew dramatically as the art of major American, European, and South American artists was exhibited, included works by, just to name a few, 
Rivera, Rivera Siqueiros, Tamayo, Brock, Picasso, Dolly, Chagall, Ekins, Copley, Jackson Pollock, Hans Hoffman, Alexander Calder, John Moran, Mark Rothko, uh, Author Dove, and George O'Keefe, and many more. It is clear from the record of exhibitions during Bywater's directorship at the DMFA that Bywater celebrated artistic individuality and stylistic diversity, although some artistic expressions were alien to his own stylistic tendency. Just as Bywater's own paintings were not provincial, the exhibitions at the DMA were not provincial. Next slide. Bywater's important importance as an artist in the history of American art was confirmed when his paintings were acquired by important collections of American art, including the James Mishner Collection of American Art at the University of Texas in Austin in 1984, and the Schoen Collection of American Art. I was fortunate to be attending graduate school at UT when James Mishner purchased Bywater's iconic painting, Oil Fill Girls. Next slide. There are many important publications and exhibitions remembering Bywater's art and career, including Sam Ratcliffe's Jerry Bywater's Interpreter of the Southwest and Ellen Neewike's Jerry Bywater's Lone Star Printmaker, A Study of His Prints, and Checklist of His Illustrations and Ephemeral Works. Important historians, including Light Cummings and Ron Tyler, have praised Bywater's and recognized his importance in the history of American art. In his biography of sculptor Allie Tennant, Dr. Cummins affirmed that Bywater's concern to correctly identify regionalism was a reaction to the prevailing obsession with modern art and cites Bywater's as saying, the truth is that artists found nationalism before the politicians. Dr. Tyler stated that, quote, Jerry Bywater's and his generation forever changed the cultural climate in our state, end quote. And in 2011, Susie Kalia placed the art of Bywaters and Hogue within the context of American art in her outstanding work entitled Alexander Hogue, an American Visionary. Kalia describes the regionalist painters who rallied around Hogue and Bywaters as, quote, concerned with developing a personal idiom rather than contributing to the comprehensive movement. They drew their inspiration from the West Texas landscape, but elevated it to a more universal level by incorporating the study of all art, end quote. Next slide. I think the most gratifying recognition of Bywaters as an artist and a visionary who brought the Texas art scene to national attention are two public art installations in Dallas. In 1993, a team of artists, including Francis Bagley and Philip Lamb, produced 12 terrazzo murals at the Dart Union Station, remembering the 1934 murals of Bywaters and Hogue. The Dart murals endeavored to unite the community past and present. In 2012, contemporary artists Brad Oldham and Christy Coltrane created the Encore Park Sculpture Wall, a ball relief mural entitled The Birth of a City, which was inspired by murals by Jerry Bywaters and Alexander Hogue. The cast brawn mural wall is composed of 10 panels, each six by four feet on Park Avenue and six panels on Young Street. The public sculpture is on the walls of the community amphitheater in Encore Park at 508 Park Avenue in Dallas. Next slide. The contemporary relief sculpture panels by Oldham and Coltrane celebrate in spirit in reference and subject, the painted murals by Bowwaters and Hogue. In 1934, Bowwaters and Hogue completed the largest public works of art project commissioned in Dallas, a series of 12 murals for the old city hall to tell the story of building the city from the first log cabin to a city center of skyscrapers. The murals of Bywaters and Hogue in Dallas's old city hall were destroyed in 1954 at a time when they were considered old fashioned. The modernization of the building included destroying the murals, adding drop ceilings, air conditioning, and the marble walls were covered over with vinyl tiles. The mural fragments were rediscovered in 2015 with a historical, with a historic renovation of old city hall 
when a historic renovation of our old city hall began. Next slide. Artists Oldham and Coltrane used historic photographs of the murals, and they found great inspiration in murals by Bywaters and Hogue for contemporary expression, stating that, quote, in the 1930s, Bywaters and Hogue told the story of Dallas, the city. Now this sculpture wall is telling the story, and our hope is that viewers will put themselves into the story and influence how the future unfolds, end quote. What a wonderful expression of art then and now. How wonderful that Bywater's history is preserved and his legacy honored in a contemporary work of art. Okay, that was it. Oh, Francine, did I, did I do it? <laughs> Ellen, you did a beautiful job. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, I just have... wanted to let everybody know that I live in the hill country and internet is really iffy here. So Ellen, thank you. I really appreciate um, You're you very doing welcome. that. You're very welcome. Are there questions? Francine, is there anything else that you would like to add real quickly? Um, I, um, when, uh, I, I, the only thing I would have added, um, uh, Ellen didn't point out who was in the uh, picture. Uh, it listed it, who was in the picture of when Oilfield Girls was per, uh, was acquired by the Huntington Museum of Art. Oh. And it, um, it included um, um, Jerry Bywaters, Mary Bywaters, Pat Bywaters, and, um, and Lee, um, who later, uh, mar her married name Swanson, I believe. And then it included uh, Becky Reese, who was curator at the time, and included me, who was the nerdy one with the glasses. <laughs> um, but um, that was a, a great moment to, to be a part of that um, uh, 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 when that Oilfield Girls was purchased uh, and acquired by uh, the Michener Collection at UT. Wow, thank, thank you for that insight. Um, Ellen, we do have a couple of questions. We'll uh, okay. one or two real quick. And if we don't get to your question, uh, please feel free to email us and we will send them along to uh, Ellen and Francine sure. to be a little bit later. But um, we have one asking, what artists um, do you believe Bywaters had a major hand in helping launch their career? Oh my, that's so hard. And Francine may have to help me with this because he was really, uh, he encouraged all the artists. He really did. And, um, you know, he wrote letters of recommendation for many of the artists. You know, when World War II uh, broke out, um, you know, he wrote letters of recommendation for artists to teach, you know, at UT Austin to Lauren Mosley. And, uh, uh, you know, so he encouraged the Texas, all the Texas artists. He really did. It's, it's just, for me, it's hard to pinpoint just one. And this may be where Francine needs to jump in. And um, Ellen, I think you're right. Um, he encouraged not only his students at SMU, he encouraged his colleagues. He encouraged um, it. it and it would be difficult. However, I'm just from um, just from talking with um, with artists um, over the years. Um, I know that uh, Jerry Bywaters influenced David Bates mm -hmm. um, uh, just just by the encouragement that that uh, Bywaters gave uh, David Bates. David and I graduated together from SMU, and um, and, and others, and it didn't matter what style the artist was working in, um, Bywaters was really very um, encouraging to them saying, you know, keep it up, do this, enter this, enter this exhibition, uh, uh, get a review in the newspaper. I mean, he, he taught them how to uh, not really promote themselves, but taught them how to be visible. And, um, and I, I think he was, he was really great at that. 
Oh, wow. Well, and just through the chat feature, um, someone chimed in with uh, Bywater is really encouraged to force Judd when they both thought at SMU. Uh, thanks for that. Um, do you all yeah. know? Oh, I'm sorry, Ellen. Oh, no, that is true. First, uh, it just popped in my mind, even when Bob Waters was director of the Dallas Museum of Art, um, he was involved with um, uh, the 12 from Texas portfolio. And these artists yes. were all, you know, included. And um, uh, so anyway, there were many ways that he he encouraged these artists. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, do you know if uh, Jerry ever used the term the Dallas Nine to describe um, him or the circle of regionalists? <laughs> Francine, I don't remember him using that term. Um, I don't think so. Uh, uh, I don't. Um, and really, in that old 1932 Art Digest, that is the only place, aside from the 1985 catalog, that's the only t place where I see the nine um, mentioned. And if you think about it, you know, so many artists were left out of the nine, including Alexander Hogue. The women artists were not included. Um, and so, uh, but that's the only place where I saw it. Quite frankly, I agree with you. Um, quite frankly, when Rick Stewart, um, I, I, uh, I remember talking to him when he was working on the on his exhibition and, and uh, catalog for the uh, for his great exhibition at the Dallas Museum, um, which was extremely gratifying to Bywaters and his colleagues to get that kind of recognition. But the term Dallas Nine that Rick Stewart used was new to me at that point. Um, and, um, and like you said, Ellen, it, it left, it was a category that was too confining. It kind of left out too many people. <laughs> um, and it, it was, it never worked for me. And when I wrote my dissertation and published the biography, I really kind of avoided the subject because it was, um, it was difficult to nail down, but thank you for nailing it down. Um, I think like Cummings, Cummins in his uh, biography of Ali Tennant, I think yeah. he explained it the best that I uh, had come in contact with, that he, he uh, like Cummins, explained uh, how the term originated, just as you said, and how and why it's used, but also its limitations. Wow. Well. Well, thank you, Ellen and Francine, uh, for just a great, insightful talk uh, about Jerry Bywaters and his work. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Scott Chase, uh, to introduce our, our next talk. But thank you all. Thank you.